Dobar dan, dobro došli na drugi današnji panel, malo kasnimo pola sata, ali tako je vada neminalno zbog lifta i sličnih stvari. Današnji izlagači su Anej Korsika iz Ljubljane, student na post-diplomskom studiju na Zrcu. Ne, ne, nisam zrcu. Na filozofskom fakultetu. I Domogoj Mihaljević iz Zagreba, koji je upravo završava studij ekonomije na temu koju ću danas govoriti. Ana je naslov kako nas bao u 1968. dalje proganja nije baš naj... neće biti ovaj naslov onoga što ćemo će danas pričati, malo je izmijenio. Stvari su s obzirom na objektivne okolnosti koje mi je objasnila, ali ja vam ne smijem reći o čemu se radi. Tako da ćemo više govoriti o krizi i nekim više na abstraktnim uvješćenjima krize i odnosno na abstraktno i kognitivno grada, tako da će, s obzirom da smo kroz jučer danas imali dosta empirijski jako dobro podliku te izlaganje, ovo će se izlaganje odvijeti na nešto više razini abstrakcije, dok će Radomoga Mihaljević pričati o nešto po nasu njegove izlaganje sablasna tišina tvorničkih srena, političke i ekonomske implikacije procesa deindustrializacije, znači pričaju o tome što se događaju u Jugoslavi, to je s Hrvatskoj zadnjih četrdesetak godina i to je to, znači imamo predviđene do četiri, ali do tri, pa produžit ćemo do kvara do četiri, tako da ostaje me vremena i za diskusiju, plus bi još iskoristio priviku da drugojima drugoracima iz Beograda će se tam dan oslobođenja, ako smo zaboravili slučajno. Ane će krenit prvi, tako da... Ane će govoriti samo na engleskom, a doma ga će na srpsku krvotu. Ok, thank you very much for having me here and congratulations to comrades at the Center for Labor Studies, first of all for establishing this center and secondly for having this conference, hopefully the first of many. And this is not just a gesture of courtesy from my part, but I believe also something really important, uh, and I'll try to make case for, for this uh, later on, something really important that left uh, in general that should do nowadays. As uh, um, many comrades, as many presenters uh, uh, have already stressed, Slovenia is somehow specific in this group of Eastern European countries, and uh, it, it, it used to be um, um, a goal of our politicians that this is a kind of um, um, Balkanian Switzerland, and um, even uh, foreign politicians have argued that this is a success story. And all these dreams seem to be shattering nowadays, seem to be turning into a nightmare. And um, it seems to me it's, it's, it's worth pointing out that only in the last uh, month and a half we had various high level visits from um, perhaps uh, soon to be loners to Slovenia. We had uh, three commissioners coming from European Commission, um, not really, in, uh, one is for fishing, one was for fishing, so, but nonetheless. <laughs> uh, we, we had the General Secretary of OECD participating in a forum on Blade on economic issues and stuff like that. We also had a representative from International Monetary Fund, and we had uh, His Excellency Mario Draghi himself, the <laughs> President of the European Central Bank. Uh, various other uh, uh, minor figures of, of Slovenian uh, uh, scene, like Peter Kralic, uh, former director of McKinsey Consultant uh, Company, and the guy, a Slovenian guy that is working at, at um, Fed, have also made uh, prominent presences in, in Slovenian media. And of course, the common denominator of all of these uh, statements, of all of these appearances, was that. Uh, stop joking around, the times are urgent, you really need to implement austerity measures, you need to implement budget cuts, otherwise the only other option is the Greece scenario. So I really think uh, um, these high level visits did, uh, did, uh, um, did succeed in, in uh, a kind of ideological stampedo and um, it's, it's much easier for this right wing government nowadays than it, it was in its first mandate to, uh, to continue with these austerity measures. Be that as it may, um, as Marco already said, uh, I hope to contribute to this debate uh, 
with uh, recourse to um, the um, theory of crisis, different interpretations of ongoing crisis on perhaps a bit more abstract level. And then I will also argue for uh, um, um, the, the, the relation between um, cognitive and abstract labor, as Primoz already um, put it excellently yesterday, is of um, grave significance. It has grave uh, political implications for the left nowadays. So, uh, it could be argued that the ongoing global crisis of capitalism functions as a certain intrusion of the real, a disruption on a scale so large that the capitalist reality itself has been severely challenged and is not self-evident anymore. A mapping of the crisis and the rational explanation have become of utmost importance. So, these debates are not only instances of class struggle in theory, but embody immense political implications in their own. But understanding of crisis already informs a stance towards the capitalist mode of production is such. So it comes as no surprise that orthodox neoclassical response rooted in the belief that bourgeois society is eternal and natural fo uh, social form perceived the crisis as an external anomaly that disrupted the otherwise rational core of the system. Instead of questioning the system itself, these critiques have focused on various ex exogenous factors, arguing that the shortage of capitalist initiative the laziness of the workers, uh, um, the hugeness of the public sector, all these other things that have already been uh, emphasized, and of course the surface of the state regulation are to be blamed for the crisis. And even more heterodox approaches, those uh, perhaps um, mainly uh, inspired by John Maynard Keynes, were unable to deliver a fundamentally different analysis. In a sense, Keynes argues that capitalist instability is ultimately bound to instability of human nature, if something as such exists. Uh, the so-called animal spirits that govern our behavior in a spontaneous rather than rational manner. So these animal spirits are to be blamed in a way. Um, and again, the, the, the cause of the crisis is in this way external, it's not imminent, it's not intrinsic. Um, there were other more critical uh, analyses like the un under-consumptionist thesis, that maintains that the fall in real wages has caused the slump of consumption. And here the idea being that with an improvement of conditions of the working class, the conditions of capitalism as such would improve. And I think here another politically very, very dangerous mistake is being made. One that neglects that the urge of capitalist production is not to satisfy human needs, but to realize profits. And as we all know, these two um, are not... Uh, um, usually are not uh, uh, synthetic, are, are not on the same track. Um, and other Marxist authors have stressed that the crisis was ultimately caused by financialization and financial instability, thus fetishizing the financial sector as something separated <laughs> and alien to the real core of capitalism. Um, Marx's own analysis, I believe, is uh, imminent and abstract. In his critique of the capitalist mode of production, he extrapolates at the most abstract level, the economic laws that govern capitalism, regardless of its specific historical formation. Recently, we had a um, translation of uh, Michel Cousson's, uh, I don't know what's the correct uh, English title, um, used to mean we, we made uh, Pure Capitalism, um, an excellent book where Michel Cousson himself also argues for, uh, for a theory of capitalism without any predicate, for a theory of capitalism, for a theory of capital, that is not burdened by any specific historical formation uh, um, by the slums or, 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 or conjunctures by capital per se. And also, um, here I would also uh, um, make recourse to Moishe Poston, who I think uh, he never really developed this in any uh, substantial way, but he, uh, he at various points also argued that this imminent historical logic of capital produces the historical dynamic in capitalism. It is not that uh, 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 human beings, society is such, is, is in charge of this historical dynamic, but is in a way a victim of, of these ups and downs that uh, the inner dynamic, the inner core of capital, its inner contradictions are expressing. And I am one of those guys that subscribe to the law of the financial fall in the rate of profit, which is uh, to some extent a controversial positions, although a very obscure debate nonetheless. Um, 
um, which was anyway by Marx himself considered uh, this law of the tendential fall in the rate of profit. Uh, he himself considered this as the most important law. In Grundrisse, uh, he, he states, I quote, this is in every respect the most important law of modern political economy and the most essential for understanding the most difficult relations. It is the most important law from the historical standpoint. It is a law which, despite its simplicity, has never before been grasped and even less consciously articulated. And indeed, um, even in uh, his let letter to, uh, to Friedrich Engels, just one month after the publishment of um, the first edition of Das Kapital, he again emphasized that uh, this movement of surplus value and the twofold nature of labor, which we will uh, have recourse later on, uh, he considers to be two most important achievements of his uh, critique of political economy. Um, so, this, this law basically is in a way already embodied in the most simple commodity form. The, the contradiction between use value and exchange value is already something that, uh, that is uh, most imminent to this law. It is a contradiction that basically causes uh, capitalism to, to produce more than it can basically sell. I'm, I'm not uh, trying to be really technical or precise, just uh, trying to, to state the main point. Um, so, the, the organic composition of, of capital that changes with the technical progress with, uh, um, each uh, capitalist must subjugate himself to because of the law of competition. Each capitalist must basically introduce technical innovations because if, and in, in such a way um, uh, increase productivity, which uh, seems to me basically means producing more in less time with eventually less workers. So this technical mm -hmm. progress, uh, something that is nowadays usually referred to as uh, in, um, investments into research and development and um, all those theories and perspectives of the knowledge society also apply to this. this these are basically just euphemisms in a way for, for laying off workers. I mean, these are objectively and long term, in a long term, these technical innovations cause laying off workers. And this changes the, the, the uh, relation uh, in the organic composition of capital because the variable part of this uh, um, organic composition, that is the, the living uh, um, work, the uh, workers, the labor power, is not needed uh, um, anymore. More, more workers can be laid off. And uh, the greater part of this organic composition uh, is now relatively um, uh, embodied in constant capital, in, in machines. But uh, Marx's main point is that only living labor can produce um, value. He, he emphasized in his go, uh, critique of Gotha program that um, wealth as such is produced by nature as well, but value as, as, as a specific uh, capitalist relation is uh, um, produced only by living labor, by, by, by labor force. And uh, um, just a very uh, common sense is that a machine cannot produce more value than it was um, at the very beginning. Uh, um, the machine cannot uh, surpass its uh, uh, um, input, the, the, the input of value that was, uh, there, is, there is no machine that would be deus ex machina in a way. Uh, sorry, not um, perpetuum mobile, a machine that would produce more value than it demanded in the first place. Anyway, so um, as Marx uh, emphasized, uh, and it is uh, perhaps worth noting that, uh, that um, in Slovenia, as, as various economists and trade uh, and representatives of trade unions have emphasized, there was not so much uh, um, investment in this research and development, in, in, in new techniques and everything, but uh, the, um, what, what Slovenian capitalists mostly did was, uh, was harshening the, the pressure on labor force. So uh, even in that way, they were not uh, 
really exemplary capitalists. And uh, Marx, this is why M. Marx emphasizes that uh, the, the profit rate does not fall because labor becomes less productive, but rather because it becomes more productive. Um, and this, um, this basically causes, uh, I would say, two things. It can cause capitalist crises, which are uh, more... Um, which are not so uh, harsh, and it can sporadic events that capitalism can overcome in a way. Um, it seems to me that this this in a way happened in in with the crisis of 70s, with the with the huge uh, uh, um, expansion of financial sector when the capitalism in a way was saved, but it was of course saved on the on the backs of working class and the, the diminishment of the social welfare state and uh, but uh, at least in the the west part of the, the globe this worked for another like 40 years and then i believe we have something that we could characterize as uh, not as capitalist cr uh, crisis but crisis of capitalism as such a much bigger a much more important historical crisis that i believe we are experiencing nowadays when the the, uh, the the profits are are still very sluggish and st seem not to be able to uh, to to re rehabilitate, um, and as Joachim yesterday already uh, emphasized, even those countries that uh, that seem to be on the safe side of the equation, for example, the the so-called economic motor of uh, engine of European Union, the Germany are already uh, uh, showing signs of economic cooldown, especially because even those um, so-called BRIC countries um, are also cooling down. The, the, the latest figures for, for China are showing that, I think, in the, in the last quarter, the, their uh, GDP growth was 7.5%, uh, which is, of course, amazing and a wet dream for any European politician. But from the Chinese perspective, that experienced a 10% uh, GDP growth in the last 30 years, it's a somehow disappointing growth. Um, so, basically, when, when capitalism as such uh, finds itself in this crisis a bit pompously, but I think still quite correctly, we could uh, uh, argue it's got two basic options, either barbarism or socialism. So we, especially in the European Union that received, and this is the most cynical thing, uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize, we have opted <laughs> for, for barbarism. And okay. we call it... Kissinger Post received it as, as well so far. I can see you is a good company. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, this barbarism goes by the name of austerity measures, and um, the the situation in Greece, in in Spain, and even more so, uh, as uh, Professor Becker already emphasized yesterday, is much more severe in in uh, in Eastern European countries, in Romania, in Baltic countries. But not much is known, and I really totally agree with that point about uh, the middle class being, in a way, really embedded in, in this capital dynamic and they, in a way, are, are, are shackled to, to their interests, their, so, so they are not uh, uh, um, protesting so much, in a way. Um, and uh, as Michael Roberts, uh, uh, who I can already highly recommend, but you already probably all of you know his blog, uh, he's also another guy that ascribes to this uh, profit rate interpretation of capitalist crisis. Um, he emphasized in one of his recent posts that, uh, for example, the, the other comparable crisis of capitalism that occurred with the Great Depression in 1929, um, that the depression as such was not sufficient to, to, to really reinvigorate, to, to uh, rehabilitate the profit rate. He, uh, his argument, and he showed this uh, empirically, was that um, Second World War, as such, was uh, was needed as well, and only later on the global uh, economy, uh, world market, entered uh, into uh, a new profit cycle. Something that uh, Hobsbawm refers to um, 
as the golden age of capitalism, something that lasted till the end, uh, from the end of Second World War till the uh, the crisis and the uh, its and the political response of uh, neoliberalism. And here is uh, uh, just one point uh, I, I I wish to emphasize from Andrew Kleeman. He he wrote a book uh, on uh, uh, the failure of capitalist production. He a very empirical book, perhaps uh, in his own words, the most empirical, perhaps even uh, 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 only Dominil and Levy have uh, uh, comparable empirical data. He, he um, concentrates uh, on the US economy, but one point, a more theoretical um, general point I really uh, liked was that he, he showed how neoliberalism as such was a political respond, response to the uh, dynamic, the historical dynamic, the crisis that capitalism encountered. So, at least for me, it seems to me that this is uh, a very important point because usually in the left circles, um, sometimes the neoliberalism, perhaps even predominantly, neoliberalism is characterized as a, a political movement, as, as a political project that uh, it surely was, but... Uh, um, uh, uh, According to his empirical data, uh, he quite pers persuasively shows that as such it was already a response. It was not a cause, but a response. So, um, and this is perhaps uh, uh, where, uh, um, where this uh, postone uh, point of, uh, of us being uh, uh, subjugated to this historical dynamic that capital as such, as a production system, uh, um, creates really comes into place. Okay, so um, the second uh, point I wish to emphasize is strongly connected to uh, to the talk Primoz gave yesterday. I totally agree with everything he said. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> he's gonna pay me for that. <laughs> He already did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the first half. <laughs> okay, so um, it seems to me that uh, a certain portion of critical theory became really uh, prone to the surface phenomena capital as such uh, uh, experience in the last um, four decades, I would say, um, and that is from the uh, offset of neoliberalism. Uh, various authors uh, have argued uh, that uh, um, work is such, labor as a productive activity nowadays is something radically different from the labor activity of, I don't know, a Victorian worker, someone that Friedrich Engels described in his condition of the um, English working class. And as I said, on the, as a surface phenomena, this, this seems legit, in a way. It, it, okay, we have an English steel worker uh, working 18 hours a day, and then we have an IT worker working in Google with his um, dog and um, eating Skittles all the day. And also 18 hours a day. <laughs> also 18 hours a day. <laughs> um, but here I would make two points. One is that uh, empirically this more classic proletariat still very much exists. It was perhaps only transferred to, to, uh, to uh, countries with uh, lower uh, um, labor costs. And the other thing is that even these more dynamic, more flexible uh, um, jobs don't really, uh, um, don't really uh, dismiss the law of value as such. Because even, even if you're not working uh, beside the machine, you're still selling your labor power. And um, here it seems to me that uh, I will, uh, the, 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 the notion of the cognitive labor is not only conceptually misleading, it seems to me that it also could be very politically problematic, especially with the political implications of, of, uh, of uh, on a new labor, uh, a new working, a new qualitatively new type of working class that is radically different for the old proletariat, the new precariat. Um, and um, 
then we can have uh, uh, these uh, political uh, strategies of, of new social rights that would correspond to this new working class, which is qualitatively different. I would, of course, argue that uh, um, it is, this still corresponds to the, uh, uh, to the Marx schema of abstract and concrete labor. Let me quote Marx on this. Um, on the one hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in the physiological sense. And it is in this quality of being equal or abstract human labor that it forms the value of commodities. On the other hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in a particular form and with, with a definite aim. And it is in this quality of being concrete useful labor that it produces use values. Um, and what becomes immediately obvious that Marx's own schema does not uh, differentiate with, between manual and intellectual labor as two generically different type of labor, but rather as two concrete expressions of the same abstract labor. Um, so according to Marx, if we disregard specific qualities of any two different types of productive labor, what remains is the expenditure of human labor in general, that is the expenditure of abstract labor. Uh, so whether we are using our brains, muscles, nerves, or hands while being engaged in this specific type of productive labor is for Marx himself irrelevant. He illustrates this with an example how banker and general play a very important role in civil society while a man himself is worth nothing. The same goes for abstract human labor. It, in its most simple form, it is not worth much. However, as a multiplication of simple labor, that is as complex labor, it can attain a much higher value. But the fact remains that complex labor, or what we are nowadays commonly referring to as cognitive intellectual labor, is only a multiplication of simple labor. Both are the expressions of the same general labor power, however differentiated these concrete expressions might be. Um, <coughs> So, as I have perhaps already emphasized enough, my main thesis, uh, this is not just my main, uh, not just my thesis, is that uh, in its very core capitalism is, has not experienced dramatic changes, but rather consists development of its inner logic that is already embodied in the commodity form and was therefore present from the very beginning. Um, so this is why I consider the notion of cognitive labor as potentially harmful to the project of political emancipation, because it introduces divisions in an area that really shouldn't exist and are not of crucial importance anyway. While the project of political articulation of abstract labor could provide us with a per perception that has a much broader understanding of social processes, especially the glo global dominance labor is effectively having on our lives. So, the political articulation of abstract labor, um, that is of the abolishment of this um, mode of capitalist mode of production as such, the abolishment of wage slavery, is of course the historical task of the left, the most difficult historical task of um, introducing a different type of, uh, a different mode of production. And uh, it seems to me crucial that uh, it, it be emphasized that uh, this wage slavery is the abstraction we, are all, we all have to subjugate ourselves to. That even the cognitariat, the precariat, all these different types of, of labor are still uh, shackled in this regime, uh, in this reg uh, abstraction of, of uh, wage slavery. And here I found uh, an interesting quote by Etienne de la Boetie, a guy from 1550s um, who wrote a discourse on voluntary servitude or the anti-dictator. This uh, uh, um, article can be found, found on the page of, I believe it's uh, uh, von Hayek Institute in America. And uh, here goes the quote. Resolve to serve no more and you are at once freed. I do not ask that you place hands upon the tyrant to topple him over but simply that you support him no longer, that then you will behold him like a great colossus whose pedestal has been pulled away, forced of his own weight, and breaks into pieces. 
I'm not going to uh, to 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 dwell on the uh, liberal and neoliberal uh, affection uh, with uh, with this author, but it seems to me this really corresponds uh, already to the title of Holloway's uh, um, book, uh, "Changing the World Without Taking Power." It uh, it uh, it forgets that, uh, um, of course, okay, uh, we can. As, as a left, as such, we can uh, organize protest. Perhaps the most uh, the most uh, um, dangerous thing, working um, from the perspective of uh, capitalist interests, working class can do is a general strike, the total halt of the production process, as such. Um, but then again, as, as uh, Adam Smith already emphasized in his Wealth of Nations, a worker usually can last for I don't know a week or two, perhaps a month. And uh, just materially speaking, financially speaking, the capitalist class as such is, uh, has got much more reserves, much more uh, assets. And uh, um, what has to be done, I strongly believe, is uh, first of all uh, um, that the left must again try to, uh, to conquer the institutions. And this was my first remark about the um, Center for uh, Labor Studies, why I believe this is really important. Uh, that we strongly uh, criticize the notion of, of the left of, of being some, I don't know, extraterrestrial unit that really doesn't have to do anything with this world, that a position of the beautiful soul, basically. I really believe that the bourgeois institutions are a proper field for, uh, for um, uh, where, uh, where a battlefield, where uh, the left should not, should not retreat from. And we should use the already existing institutions, the media, to, to disseminate our ideas. And of course, this, this needs to be, um, to be done in a way that uh, we can address most people. But then again, we have to, to realize that uh, the existing institutions that are not uh, conquered by the left uh, have a, a certain real limit to them. So this is why it's so important that the left as such establishes its own institutions that uh, um, could perhaps uh, um, prolong its life. Because uh, uh, what I'm, what I'm uh, suggesting is that um, too often, especially in, in the 90s, uh, it seems to me it has been uh, uh, left up to, to the enthusiasm, to the uh, incentiveness of the uh, specific group of people. And already the generation, genera when generations change, there could be drastic uh, um, implications for the left as such. So this is why I also believe institutions are of crucial importance so that the left in this way guarantees itself a kind of immortality. Thank you. Hvala Neju, sad će nam Domagoj, ne na kraju, sad će nam Domagoj reći